Back, episode nine, playing with other people's toys, brought to you by Beige, the color with no holiday baggage. I am Rylan Grant, screenwriter, extraordinaire, Ringo award-winning creator of fine comics like Aberrant, Banjax, and The Peacekeepers. The other voice in the dark, the man in the box to the left is... David Avalone, screenwriter and filmmaker and comic book writer and doer of things and stuff and junk. And junk. That's <laughs> nice. I didn't know you did junk also. Oh, I'm yeah. So much stuff and yeah. junk. Yeah. Show me your junk, dude. Um, and, well, uh, not that, on this that, show. That, that, That's that a very different for, podcast. Yeah. Yeah, we're having a, uh, yeah, this is a bad start. We're already off to a bad start. Um, <laughs> if you uh, missed our last episode, which started off uh, decidedly better, uh, the politics and comics uh, episode with uh, Pulitzer Prize finalists Lalo Alcaraz and uh, New Yorker cartoonist Emily Flake, I strongly suggest that you uh, uh, back it on up and check that out. Um, but we have a great show today. Uh, uh, it's only going to get better. Uh, Avalone, why don't you go ahead and bring the uh, the guests on for us? Huh? Bringing in the guests, Cecil Castellucci, Sean Lewis. Hey, kids! Howdy, howdy! Oh howdy. wow! You got you guys just swap positions. That's it's totally totally messed with me. We were <laughs> we, we we were all talking pre-show, and Cecil and Sean were were transposed. I guess I is how you would it, say it. It. Now, it's it's gonna take it's gonna, it's gonna take me twenty minutes to get used to this. Now, how you guys doing? <laughs> good, 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 good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cecil, why don't you start off and introduce yourself? Oh, okay. Well, uh, hi, my name is Cecil Castellucci. Um, I'm a writer of uh, comic books and um, novels and librettos for operas. Um, I also used to be in a punk band. And uh, uh, But I would like to say that I'm very impressed that this show was brought uh, to us by the color beige because one of my novels, it's a book about punk rock, is called Beige. Um, and it's all about a girl whose dad is a punk rock musician and she do she doesn't like punk rock because it's too loud and so everybody calls her Beige. That's her nickname. So um, uh, anyway, I just finished a run on um, Batgirl and uh, uh, I had a, um, uh, my newest graphic novel uh, is uh, called The Plain James with Jim Rugg. And it's um, about an all girl guerrilla art group that does art and activism, which I think is really timely for right now, uh, 2020. Uh, and that's me, Cecil. And if you want the the uh, official Cecil Castellucci uh, secret origin story, pick up the book, uh, is Girl on Film? Yeah, Girl on Film. Girl on Film is also my other new graphic novel, which is a memoir about art and memory uh, and growing up in New York City and intersect going to the high school performing arts. Uh, and it's, with, it's a it's a it's a great book. Thank you. It's a great book. And Sean. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Sean Lewis. I am the uh, writer and creator of a couple of books at Image Comics. Um, Saints, The Few, Coyotes, Thumbs and most currently Bliss and um uh, upcoming, I'm writing Superman and Metropolis for the Future State event here at DC. Prior to that, like 20 years as an artistic director and playwright and director of theater, and then I've directed and written some short film and TV stuff that is played at like the Tribeca Film Festival and nice. other places like that. Where were you the artistic director? What was the theater? So I've run two different companies. I ran a touring company for about 15 years called Working Group. Um, that we would tour to places like in Los Angeles, like Red Cat, uh, and mm -hmm. then internationally, we did a bunch of work in Africa and Europe, and we would tour to performing arts centers. And then I ran a regional theater in Iowa uh, called Riverside Theater for about two years. In, like, I, my wife uh, used to produce live burlesque for about oh. a dozen years in Los Angeles, and I was sort of her unofficial helper and sometime MC. Our MC, our regular MC was a rabbi, so I only MC'd on high holy days and during the Sabbath. <laughs> true story. Uh, nice. True burlesque story. But I am exhausted thinking about that running a theater company for any length of time, even with that limited experience. I don't encourage it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and especially in LA, putting asses in seats with yeah. any kind of regularity is brutal. Yeah, I would imagine there's also like really weird equity contracts in, in LA with like the 99C contracts that are just a totally different animal. Where if you have yeah. a hit you know, you have to like close it. <laughs> you have to do a bunch of weird I did I did use the equity contract as an excuse to limit the uh, guest list to my wedding. 
we had it in it. We had it at the uh, the Steve Allen Theater, which was an equity waiver, ninety nine seater. And I was like, "Gotta, sorry, gotta cap the guest list at hundred. This is an equity waiver wedding. We, you know, I don't want to get, I don't want to get shut down by the union, by the guild uh, for having too many people at my wedding." But uh, and- we, uh, uh, my wife and I, we got married uh, uh, directly across the street from uh, the White House at a hotel called the Hay Adams which is, uh, I guess it's physically, it is physically the building closest to the White House. And we were getting married on the roof. And so uh, all of our guests had to be cleared by Secret Service. Um, and so that became a kind of built-in excuse, you know, like the the odd uncle that, uh, you know, was a felon being like, well, we'd love to invite you, but you know, you're, <laughs> you're not going to, uh, you're not going to pass the background check. You've been determined check, a security risk for our wedding. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But. Uh, Pretty funny. So but, you- um, but. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, oh no, I was just gonna say we were, we were all talking before, and um, uh, you know, we all know each other in kind of uh, weird, odd ways, and have these weird, odd connections. So we should probably disclose that and discuss that uh, uh, before um, we kind of move into our our, our, our topic. So, um, little known fact: so Sean and I, we've known each other for is it twenty years now? It's got it. twenty years. It's either ninety nine or two thousand. So yeah, so it, it might, years at this point. Yeah, it might be twenty-one years. So, uh, so yeah, I was. Uh, uh, we were both in college. Um, we spent a summer at NYU together. Uh, Sean was studying at the Stella Adler Conservatory as an actor, um, and I was in New York uh, working for Hal Hartley, interning for Hal Hartley. Um, and uh, yeah, weird times. Um, so, so we're living at, um, we're living in the middle of, uh, New York city, you know, kind of like right on the corner of Washington square park, we're at fifth Avenue and 10th street. Um, uh, Ethan Hawk and Uma Thurman are our neighbors. Essentially they lived in the uh, building across the street with Betsy Johnson. Uh, you walk down the street to get coffee and Janine Garofalo is in the, uh, the, the, the cafe. Um, and, uh, Sean and I are paying, I think, was it? Was it five hundred a month or something yeah, like that? It was incredibly so, low to live in the dorms. Yeah, and, 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 and I was at Hayden Hall. Oh, there we go. <laughs> nice. It's a small Hayden. world. Yeah, and um, and, and yeah, yeah. It was five hundred dollars a month, and all our meals were included. <laughs> Yeah, so so it was like I you know I, I had friends who I was working with at, at Hal Hartley's place who um you know they were paying like twenty five hundred dollars a month to like share a studio above a Chinese restaurant, uh <laughs> you, you know way downtown and uh and and, and above we a Chinese restaurant deal. and below another Chinese restaurant I think <laughs> somehow <laughs> um, yeah so that was uh you know I I thought that was an interesting thing I mean uh, uh we, we have we have come a long way I think um and you know I don't think um I, we both loved comics back then but I don't think we ever had like a uh, a even like a twinkle in our eye that we were going to end up. No. writing them no there's no know? way i thought i was writing comic books at that point or that was even a possibility i didn't know how you even got the opportunity to yeah how about cecil did you ever think when when did when did comics i know it's in the book but when did comics pop into your life as a thing you were doing well um i mean i always loved comics because i always read them um but uh when i was uh living in montreal I worked at a vegetarian co-op cafe when I went, uh, I had to drop out of NYU because I ran out of money and my parents had moved back to Canada because I'm French Canadian. And um, uh, so I decided to go to college, you know, finish off film school in, um, in Montreal. And I was working at a vegetarian co-op cafe in a punk band. And um, this guy who was a regular at the cafe was uh, starting up a um, comics company and he would do all of these um, things, uh, bon dessinée en direct, uh, live comic jams, where um, people would come. Anyway, the company he was starting was drawn in quarterly, and um, so uh, and the people that were coming and doing these comic jams were, um, you know, uh, Seth and uh, Chester Brown and Julie Doucette and you know all these amazing Canadian indie comics people. And um, so for me, it was just sort of this. Oh yeah, comics, of course. I already love them and people are making them all around me. But for me, when I really knew that um it was something that I wanted to do and pursue, and like Sean was saying, I just had no idea how you went about and did it, was um I read 
you know, I write YA novels. That's what the first part of my writing career was. And um, before I was published writing YA novels, I'd, re I'd read a Vertigo comic book called uh, The Dead Enders uh, by um, uh, Ed Brubaker and I think Tony Leakes. I'm not sure who the artist is. I'm blanking on the artist right now. Anyways, um, to me, when I read that, I was like, that's a YA book. This is a YA book. And I want to write YA books. I love comics. I think I could do this. This is my vibe. So I, uh, there wasn't Google. There was Alta Vista at the time. <laughs> so I nice. asked them, how to submit a Vertigo comic book. You know, this is like 1999. And um, I, had, I couldn't figure it out. And they had like sort of portfolio review things, but there was nothing for writers. So I just thought, well, I guess I'm never going to be a comic book writer. Um, and, uh, and, and there was a lot of sadness about it. So it was something, and then I finally got to do it when, um, Vertigo was starting their mini imprint called Minx. Um, and Shelley Bond had read my first YA novel, Boyproof, which is about a girl who's obsessed with post-apocalyptic science fiction films and Vertigo comics. And she thought, oh, maybe this chick wants to write comics. And so she, um, she called me and- wow he had edited the dead enders. And so it was like this amazing, you know, kind of, that looked like took like seven years, but, um, but uh, yeah, because I couldn't, like Sean said, I couldn't figure out how you, how you broke in, you know? Yeah. It's, it's such an interesting thing. It's like, I, I, I'm sitting here thinking about, I mean, I'm thinking about that time because I don't think about that time too often when I was in college and I, you know, I actually tried comics. I mean, almost like you, it's almost the same story. This is shortly after this is shortly after Sean and I, you know, spent our, our summer together or whatever. Um, I was back at the University of Michigan. That was where I went to college. And I, and I tried comics also. Um, but it was such a I mean, it was so hard. I mean, it was back then you had to know a you had to know an artist who was in your town, right? Um, you know, where in the hell do you find a colorist? Where do you, you know, all of this stuff? Like you're dealing with physical drawings, uh, revisions are a pain in the ass. Like, um, you know, unless you are I don't know, you could end up in a place where there are a lot of people doing it and that would be, and, and that would be conducive to actually getting one of these things done. But being like a college student in Ann Arbor, Michigan, just wasn't happening, you know? And so I took a crack at it when I was, you know, whatever, 20 years old and, uh, you know, fell flat on my face. And it, it wasn't really until, you know, I, I, um, you know, comics were kind of the first love and then I had to kind of settle for this you know, career writing action movies. I always sound like an asshole when I say that, but, um, but uh, you know, I realized maybe five years ago um, that I mean, five years ago in particular, it got so much easier to do this. You know, um, uh, uh, the um, that was when digital workflow like really kind of solidified, right? And so now, you know, I mean, every artist I deal with, they haven't drawn on paper in years, right? I mean, uh, uh, big files are just traded via Dropbox. Uh, uh, revisions happen in an instant. Um, you know, I, I, I get a, I get a page from an artist in, uh, in Brazil, uh, it goes to a colorist in Indonesia and then it goes to a letterer in the UK and all of that happens in just, you know, uh, an, an instant. And really like for me, the big leap that made it possible was, um, the networking, particularly like the social networking. It was like finding collaborators was always a hard thing. And it was like, you know, again, back in the day, it's like, okay, well, I had to know somebody in my town or I had to go to a comic con and hope that I like trip over the right person in an artist right. alley or something like that. Um, you're talking on the phone and you can't see things. And, um, you know, but, but now you go on Facebook and there are groups like connecting comic book writers and artists and they have 30,000 members. And all it is is like an artist gallery, right? And, and, and you have, amazing artists and terrible artists and everything in between. And there is somebody to kind of fit your project and your price range. And it becomes really easy to kind of meet people. Um, you know, and then like blink of an eye, I have five titles in the pipe, you know what I'm saying? And you know, I think Sean, like, I, I mean, I think your foray into this was very similar, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, well, I actually weirdly had the artist in the town. Like I I'd given up the comic dream for like, I think, I think like my first year out of undergrad, I was starting to write plays at that point and Marvel had like a talent contest. I remember sending them like a very weird hip hop adaptation of the Oristaya that they did not think would fit any of their comics. <laughs> well, that <laughs> sounds fantastic. Yeah, you should pitch that again. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, you'd sell it now. I just remember like, sending it and getting a, a getting a rejection letter back that was very much like, ah, no. 
And then I just kind of gave up on the dream at that point. And then I guess 15 to 15 years later. Yeah. At least 15, about 15 years later, 14 years later, I was working on a, a play for a theater company I was running. I was directing it and I had hired an artist to do, um, we were using like an old school overhead crank projector to do live animations. So I hired an artist to do drawing at the same time that we were cranking it. So it'd be like this cartoon. Wow. And that artist was Ben Mackey who ended up doing Saints with me. Cause the art that he was bringing in, I was like, this is like old school comic drawings. Like I didn't know him super well. We were set up by a professor at the University of Iowa I knew that he had studied with. And um, once I saw the art, I was just like, do you like comics? And he was like, yeah, I love comics. And I was like, have you ever made one? And he was like, no. And we were literally painting the set together and we came up with the idea of Saints. Like we were it's like five o'clock in the morning, just painting a set white and going like, well, what if they were these saints, but they're like the X-Men. And then we, we didn't know what we were doing, which helped us. So we just made a full book of it. And we're like, I guess we'll put it on like comiXology. Cause that was, we were, I guess that was starting at that point. You could just upload anything. And then I did a really quick cursory like look and Eric Stevens' email was still on the image site at that point. I don't think it is. I, I think they got rid of it. <laughs> and I just sent him a cold email and was like, hey, my name's Sean. Here's some of the things I've done. I've never worked in comics, but here's our comic. And then that amazingly led to Saints getting published. Like he, he read wild. it. Yeah, it was kind of, I, I and everyone I talked to since, they're like, I would have never, that was <laughs> maybe not the smartest move, but it, it worked out at the time. I think Eric was intrigued by that I I had n that about the other experience because I'd worked at the, I'd, I'd done some stories for This American Life at that point, and I know he was intrigued by that and the the playwriting. He both of those things he was really fascinated by, and so he, he was willing to look past the not really having done comics before. I I think that's part of it, right? Like, um, you know, it's like a lot of people, a lot of kids, a lot of, you know, aspiring comics writers like say, well, how do you do it? And it's like work begets work. Do your work and things will happen. I mean, how did I get into writing comics? I wrote novels and then somebody read them and was like, do you want to maybe do this? I absolutely think that like that would totally intrigue someone because I think one of the hardest things, any kind of writing, right, at all is, um, you know, uh, like, the hardest thing for anybody to do is to actually finish a project, to complete it. And so if you've completed work before, then people know that you can probably complete the thing that they're asking you to do. I mean, I think that's like, that puts you at the top of the list, I think. Yep. I do think there is an overall thing, and I've noticed this in all industries. There is, it's sort of that thing of an expert is someone from 40 miles away. The any success in any other field is better than being an amateur in the field that you're actually applying for a job in. Uh, the movie industry loves playwrights. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like the, in a way that they don't love screenwriters, <laughs> you know, because it's like, well, this is justified because this person has had success somewhere else. And um, I'm a perfect example of that in that I couldn't get arrested as a screenwriter for literally decades. And I've been working, doing development and screenwriting for a production company only because I'm a comic book writer. Like when I had 30 years experience making independent films, no one gave a shit. When I was like, well, I wrote these comics. They're like, oh, come in and sit down. You really understand story. I'm like, I understood it before I wrote comic books, but <laughs> you like seeing my name on a piece of paper that someone printed, so that's, I guess that works too. I actually start, I, I drew my own comics when I was a kid and I am bad. The <laughs> nicest thing anyone ever said, a friend of mine in college said, it's sort of like if Don Heck said, had some kind of physical dif disability that uh, you know was keeping him from doing it really well. Uh, fifth rate Don Heck was as, as good as I got. Um, and then I had an opportunity in 2000 that I wasn't able to make, I had like, the golden ticket opportunity. I met Joe Casada at a cocktail party and talked to him for a couple of hours and we we're having a great time. He's like, yeah, you ever think about writing comic books? But they had at the time a like new writers program that was not, I mean, they discontinued it. That's how great it was. And uh, he just sort of shunted me into that and I sort of got lost in the shuffle of it. And then literally like 15 years after that, someone offered me an opportunity to meet a bunch of editors at 
Comic Con and I met Joe Ryban over at Dynamite, and he decided to take a chance on me writing uh, a steampunk Vampirella series for them. And you know, I delivered it on time. <laughs> you know, I hit my deadline, and it was something someone could draw. And I think that uh, that's that's more than a lot of people can do. Unbelievably, um, you know. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because it's like I started not doing single issues, right? I started doing graphic novels, um, YA graphic novels. And, I, you know, it took me like 12 years or you know, 11, 11 years to finally get a monthly comic, you know, with Shade the Changing Girl. And that was like me, like every Comic-Con, like running into Dan DiDio and being like, hello, my name is Cecil Castellucci and I'd like to come <laughs> DC universe. Everybody just kind of waving me off and, and stuff. And, um, and, you know, even though I had all these graphic novels um, and stuff to me, being a comic book writer was doing a monthly comic book, you know, and that totally. was, like, so it almost feels like, and when shade came out, like, I mean, there were, I did tons of interviews and people would be like, so how do you feel writing comics for the first time? I was like, well, I've been writing them for 11 years. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but yeah, I don't know. For me, that was always like the golden, uh, the golden, the golden thing. And I think it's like, even when you're in, you know, like you still, there's still other sort of blocks and, and things to, you know, to try, to try to get in. And, you know, I, I'm sure that, you know, and I, I hate to say it with you gentlemen here, but I'm sure that that also had to do with being, uh, being a woman and trying to break into the, um, superhero, you know, sort of world, like, you know, it certainly feels like it took, you know, twice the time that it did my, you know, my, my, some of my, some of my male contemporaries, you know, no offense to you guys. <laughs> oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's definitely a barrier. And we were talking about, you know, working with artists and the, the way things have been facilitated by the internet and by being able to contact people. I hired an artist for something recently from the visible woman hashtag on Twitter. Now the world being microscopic after I reached out to her, she said, I sat with you at a table at New Mexico comic-con with about 20 other people having drinks and we didn't actually talk to each other, but you were like 20 feet away. So we actually have met. I was like, Oh, great. I just liked your art. I had no idea we had actually met each other. Um, and the ability to do that, like Ryland said, the thing that I just finished, the artist is in Naples and the colorist is in Glasgow, somewhere in Scotland. I can't remember which Scottish city she's in. And uh, the letters in New Jersey, because you know you gotta have some New Jersey in there at all times. But, uh, but yeah, you're talking about writing capes. I've actually, and having a monthly book, I felt the same way about a monthly book. I've never technically had a monthly book what I've had is mini series that sold so well that in the middle of writing the second issue, they're like, so could you do an issue five? How about an issue six? And I was like, you got to commit to another four at least so I can plot an arc. And I think the, the, the longest I've gone is 12. And then Betty Page has been three different mini series running between eight issues and 10 issues, depending on the, Part of me is like, it would be so nice if it was 25 issues. <laughs> you know? It would be so great if the last issue had been issue 25 and not issue 10 of series three. But, you know, you, you, take, you take what you can get. But we're talking about, uh, you're talking about writing capes. And we, the, the topic we, had, we wanted to get to today is, uh, you know, if you love comics, there are characters that you always wanted to write. And you have your own stuff that you want to do. And... Uh, wanted to talk about, you know, the ups and downs and the challenges and responsibilities of playing with other people's toys versus playing with your own. The very first thing I ever read, wrote, and it's probably my career highlight, uh, was a two-page short story for the Star Wars role-playing game. Uh, and a friend of mine, actually a young Star Wars fan friend of mine, pointed out to me that the premiere episode of The Mandalorian is influenced by my Star Wars short story. In 1989, I wrote a short story in which Boba Fett kills IG-88. And my friend was like, you notice the first episode of the series was a Mandalorian and an IG robot going into combat together. I was like, oh yeah, that is kind of a little echo from those days. 
And that was, of course, a thrill for me as a Star Wars fan to write Star Wars. But uh, uh, Cecil, you've written my favorite characters in the DC universe, the uh, the crew on Apocalypse. You did Me Too on Apocalypse with, uh, with the Furies, which is amazing. And Sean, you're getting to write Superman, of which I am also jealous. Let's whoever wants to go first, you know, talk about did you love Superman? Did you love the fourth world stuff? Like what? What's what's the the process with those projects? Go. Oh sure, sorry. <laughs> Always the trick when there's four. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I didn't, I was a much bigger Marvel kid. There was no comic shop in my hometown, so I used to go down to the local pharmacy, and whatever was on the spinner rack would be what I read. And it was it was heavily heavily marvel and then there would be like a stray batman comic like an, an almost always an annual it would be like the batman annual would show up and then it was all x-men and every spider-man title um so i grew up like really obsessed with the x-men and daredevil but those were two that i really really loved I, I was like growing up during like the frank miller run on daredevil and i had an older uncle and and vertigo i had an uncle my uncle lived with us and he had all these vertigo comics so I was way too young showing up at school with Preacher and, and at, at the Catholic school. <laughs> Your um, uncle who taught you that with great power must come great responsibility, obviously. Yeah, clearly, clearly. <laughs> you can't even swamp thing to give to, you know, the, the mother superior. Um, so, no, I mean, I, I didn't really grow up with Superman. Um, however, having a kid and kind of the chaos of the last couple of years, I've grown to really get interested in him. And as I started getting more interested in possibly writing for, for DC or Marvel, I was going back and reading a lot of older comics from both sides and I was catching up on some DC stuff. And I had read some Superman that I, I was really connecting to in a way that I didn't when I was younger. Uh, I didn't just, I just didn't relate to him. And I think like the idea of, um, the idea of a dude just being good, just like, revolutionary suddenly so <laughs> i think radical was, kindness i mean I, I remember saying that when jamie at, at dc talked to me about super about like if i would want to pitch superman i was like yeah i think like a guy who's just good and decent right like that sounds awesome and very very punk rock right now so i'll gladly totally I'll gladly see what that's like um and i've really grown to like like fall in love with it in, while working on it um so it's it's grown my appreciation for sure. Yeah, and Cecil, yeah. you've you've also done the the, the Batgirl run. Yeah, I just finished Batgirl. They just um, Batgirl is finished. Um, uh, the series they they canceled it because they're doing all the, who knows what's coming up next after yeah. features. Um, but uh, yeah, so I did Batgirl and Batgirl. I mean, I always loved Batgirl. I mean, Batman was always, you know, my my guy. He was my boyfriend. But um, you know, getting to write in the Bat family was incredible, and um, I get to write the Bat family, and it's more from Batman's point of view in the um, in the uh, the um, death metal, the you know DC metal um, uh, thing. I get I, I do a little short story there, and. Um, I, you know, for me, working in continuity is, you know, you're not working in continuity. I don't know what future state is really, but like, but I know it's, I mean, I'm guessing that it's some kind of continuity, but I don't know if it was like the continuity that they have the way that they have now when I was doing Batgirl. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the challenge with that was that, you know, Batgirl as a second tier character, even though she's like a, you know, very iconic character is sort of beholden to whatever else is happening in the DC universe. So when I dropped in, um, you know, I was in three crossover events at the same time at my first issue. I was in Year of the Villain, I was in City of Bane, and I was in Leviathan. And so I wow. had to adjust my story constantly to be able to accommodate what those other crossovers were doing, um, you know, and then, you know, at the end, I, you know, I, I, I you know, uh, James Tynan, you know, was doing Joker War. And so then I had to like, you know, adjust to that. So that makes it a lot more complicated when you're, um, when you're, 
when you're writing in continuity and you're not the engine that's driving the world, you know, um, but you're the engine, you're the, you're, you're reacting to the world. Um, and I'm, I, you know, I'm not complaining about that. It was just a very, it's a very different kind of challenge than say, uh, you know, reinventing Shade the Changing Man to being Shade the Changing Girl and getting to sort of, you know, be in my own little bubble universe where I can do whatever I want or, um, the female furies where, you know, um, I, you know, it was a six issue miniseries and I'm not in continuity. And I, I think the sort of joke, I was just talking about the, the female furies and Mr. Miracle with Tom King at Baltimore comic-con on a, on one of these. And, uh, you know, it's like the, I think the, the, the thing with a lot of those outside of continuity things is that they're not in continuity until DC decides that they're in continuity if they right. decide. So that's why I say that about future state. It's like, maybe, who knows, right? Like, right. Um, but uh, so, you know, but that, you know, writing uh, the Me Too movement on Apocalypse, you know, with the female furies um, was really great because you're getting to work with these iconic characters that people know, um, but, you know, but you have to, um, but you're not sort of behold, you have to keep true to their core, but you're not beholden to sort of what is happening in the bigger universe. So was I a fan of Batgirl? Yes, absolutely. But of course, once I got the job, it's like Sean said, you just start doing a lot of research. You know, you start like researching a lot. And um, with um, the female Furies, basically what happened was that I, I was done with Shade the Changing Girl. I knew I wasn't on anybody's lists at DC. I met with Dan DiDio and I brought the encyclopedia. I Xeroxed all these pages from the encyclopedia. And I was like, maybe I could reboot this character. Or maybe I could reboot this one. Or maybe I could do this. Right. He's like, ah, Jeff Lemire's doing that one. And Scott Snyder's got that one. And this guy <laughs> this one. And like, you know, and I was just like, you know, and, and he was comparing them to like TV shows, you know, or whatever. And they were all boy heavy. And I was just like, ugh, where's your Handmaid's Tale in the DC universe? And he was like, oh, that's a good idea. And that's how he was like, if you can crack that. Um, and I was like, oh, well, I know the female Furies, but I don't, you know, it's like, that's, you know, I've never read the, the fourth world. And then he went under his desk and brought up <laughs> the omnibus and was like, do your homework and see if you wow. can do something. And um, so I think it's kind of like what Sean said. It's like, you know, these characters, you kind of have a vague sort of impression of them because you're fluent in the sort of language of comics and you're paying attention to a certain extent. But until you actually sort of get asked or tasked, um, you know, that's when the real fun begins, you know, and, you know, kind of kind of dive in. People always ask me, like, I'm sure they ask you, like, all um like, well, what character would you love to take next and do whatever? It's like, I don't know, throw one at me. <laughs> yeah. what I come up with, you know, because because I'm gonna, you know, like I it just got announced two days ago, but um, you know, Jeff Lemire had emailed me and was like, you know, uh, do you want to do something in the Black Hammer universe? You can do any character you want. Now, I never, I mean, I read the first six and you know, I hadn't really like you know, studied all of them. But as soon as like that task is sort of thrown at you, you're like, yes. And then you like, you know, get in there. Right. Absolutely. Well, as, as someone who is a fan of both shade, the changing man and a huge fan of the Kirby fourth world stuff, I, you know, I think you did a fantastic job uh, really doing credit and you and Tom King both clearly the fourth world characters are one of the greatest sets of human metaphors anyone has ever devised. And to use them in that way, I think is ex Jack Kirby wanted that. I don't think he wanted dark side and <clears throat> Superman punch each other for 20 pages for the rest of eternity. I don't, I don't think that was what he had in mind for the future of that series was, yeah, it's just going to be, you know, dark side is just Lex Luthor crossed with Darth Vader. You know, it's, it's a, uh, it's far more interesting, I think, and compelling stuff than that. And you did something very, and you know, you were in a sense in continuity, just continuity from 30 years ago with oh. the pact and with, you know. I, my with, book is like, you could slide it right into Kirby's books and whatever. Tom's is a little bit different. Like Tom's yeah. is outside of that, but, but mine. Well, like, and Tom also shakes the S just sketch in the 12th issue a little bit. Yeah, he totally which, does. But, but you know. Like, my book is like literally pulled from between the gutters 
from Mr. Miracle issue nine in Korea. Yeah. You know, it's like it is that issue exploded and expanded into a six issue miniseries. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and I, I, that's, you know, that's sort of the great job with these characters that have been around forever. I mean, that Star Wars short story I was telling you about, the assignment was stuff that happens off screen in Return of the Jedi. And I cheated and went, well, Boba Fett delivering the Han Solo coffee table to Tatooine is sort of off screen in Return of the Jedi. It's really off screen in Empire Strikes Back. Uh, but that was the fun of like writing like this. We know this happened. How did this happen? Isn't it kind of interesting how that might have happened? My favorite story in that book, which didn't was the one that didn't get turned into toys and action figures and whatever, is Luke Skywalker surrendering to Darth Vader. I always thought that must have been tricky, walking out of the woods up to a bunch of stormtroopers. And the, clim that, uh, the climax of that story is the stormtroopers mostly want their picture taken with him. <laughs> it's me and the guy that blew up the Death Star. I thought that, like, what are their soldiers? What else would they do? Um, <laughs> But you know that's yeah. th that is the thing, and I always say that yeah, I have no ideas for the Fantastic Four. And if you immediately came to me and said you're just starting on it tomorrow, my first, my very first reaction would be, oh, I guess they fight Doctor Doom or something. I don't know. But you know, a week later, I would come <clears throat> up with something that I would be very, very excited about and thrilled to do. And because you know, you dig in, you do your research, you do your homework, and these characters have been around for so long for very good reason. I mean, some of the licensed stuff I've done, the Betty Page and Elvira stuff, there was no continuity to fit into. I was allowed to sort of create those universes based on those uh, real people and licensed characters who are represented by real people. Um, and luckily had, didn't have, and Dynamite is not terribly big on continuity. When I did Doc Savage <laughs> for them, I was like, so does this have to fit in with the Chris Roberson? And they were like, don't worry about it. <laughs> Just write a Doc Savage story. Don't worry about anybody else's Doc Savage story. It's like, okay, that's fair. Um, Again, go ahead. Go ahead, uh, no, I, I was just gonna say my my uh, uh, you know Cecil talks about this question like you know okay well you know uh, I think I've gotten it from literally every interviewer I've ever sat down with um, the you know whatever what's your dream story like you know if you want to do what DC character do you want to write what Marvel character do you want to write. Um, my dream project uh, response is always, I don't know if it's disappointing or just twisted and weird um, because it's like, it, 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 here's the thing. It's like, I, I would, I would absolutely, I, you know, l like Avalone, I would, I, I would find a way to passionately write a Marvel or DC character. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to urinate all over my chances uh, of, of, of eventually writing there, but it's like, you know, I, I mean, I am lucky in that I have this, you know, lucrative, steady day job writing film and TV. And so this comic thing is kind of a passionate side deal to a certain degree. And so it's like, so I'm not like, I'm not out there just looking for work in comics, right? I mean, I'm, I'm making my own comics and, and, and when an opportunity comes up that excites me, then I start to talk about it. Um, but it's like, you know, my, my dream project uh, uh, would be, be to like write the Cobra Kai comic for IDW, you know, and it's it's the weirdest answer ever, but the idea of you know doing something in the Karate Kid universe is like is, is amazing. That's the dream project for me. The Karate yeah. Kid, the Karate Kid cinematic universe. Yeah, well, they, you know, Johnny Lawrence is my spirit animal. I'm I, I was born to write Johnny Lawrence, and uh, and 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 you know, to tell you the truth, I think that title needs me. Um, but um, but new go, version or like, would it be set in the '80s or would it be set now? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, I am not certain. I don't have the pitch in my holster right now. The, the, the thing that really excites, the, 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 the thing that came to mind, uh, an interviewer, I, I was on a podcast maybe two, three weeks ago, and an interviewer asked this question and I hit him with the, the Cobra Kai thing. And he's like, okay, so what's the pitch? And, and, you know, I mean, I, I didn't, it was just kind of coming out of my mouth there. I, I realized I didn't have the pitch, but Avalone talks about pulling on the little, little threads, the little, the little strings, you know, it's like, you're talking about, see, so you go back, you read through these comics and you find like, oh, well, this element's interesting. Oh, they never explored that. How did Luke uh, surrender to the, the stormtroopers? How did, you know, how did this happen? How did that happen? And um, the, uh, in, in the Cobra Kai TV series, uh, John Kreese, uh, 
uh, there's like a single scene where John Kreese starts telling like tall tales of uh, of uh, of these experiences he, he had like training you know Green Berets in Afghanistan and and um, and 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 the idea of bringing to life one of like John Kreese's uh, you know like you know soldiers in the sandbox fantasy tales would be kind of amazing you know uh, 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 that's a one shot idea. Um, that was just what kind of pops into my mind, but I, I don't know what the story is yet. And and, and you know what? I, I mean, I think Cecil, if we're dealing with Karate Kid, you can't. I mean, if you watch Cobra Kai, like you, you can't have one without the other, right? Um, Absolutely, no, totally. You're totally yeah. right. um, because they, they flash back to it, you know, that so much. Oh. Um, you know, I, that would be an interesting challenge. I don't know whether or not if uh, IDW or whoever came up to me and said, uh, you know, Cobra Kai, go. I don't know. I don't know what I'd come. Up. I think I would do a one shot set in the '80s. That's yeah. what I, I, I would do it in a second, and so it, it, you know, it, it, and so 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 w w when that idea uh, uh, enticed me, um, the first thing I did, I mean, I you know, I obviously have these like Hollywood connections, and so I started asking around, and um, you know, I got close on a couple of things. Um, I was talking about a Midnight Run book uh, with Universal um, that uh, that we didn't quite, uh, uh, you know, I mean, it's like they're they're very they have these properties, they want to protect these properties, and there are certain instances. In which they'll kind of let them go, um, but um, and then the closest the closest we ever got, um, there was a new short circuit movie uh, coming out. Um, I mean, it was supposed to be out, you know, this year or next. Uh, you know, kind of got kicked on the road because of because of COVID, and got got fairly close on a uh, on a comic book set in the world of short circuit. <laughs> um, and, and, and that was definitely one where it was like they came to me, and it was like as a kid, I love short circuit. Johnny Five was was awesome. Uh, and, and it was like, um, you know, they're like, well, what, well, you know, I'm asking about one property and they're like, we have this one. What do you think about this one? Um, and then it's like, you know what? I haven't watched short circuit in, I, I don't know how long, 25 years. Let, let me, you know, let me pop it in, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and take a look. And then like, you kind of re fall in love with it again. Right. Like, because there are great things about it. I mean, there are things that, that really don't, uh, uh, stand the, the test of time. There's a character in brown face, which is particularly <laughs> offensive even. and awful, which, which any, w w which any update of course needs to, uh, 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 you know, wipe the slate clean on. Um, however, like you fought, you are a kid again watching this thing. Right. And you can kind of re-experience that joy. And I think the idea of kind of, I don't know, repackaging, redistilling that joy or kind of looking at it through a new adult lens is very interesting. And so like, I found myself falling in love with short circuit, right? Um, and, you know, and for various reasons, mostly COVID reasons, like that didn't happen. Not to say that it can or won't, but um, it is interesting the things that you can kind of fall in love with, like just as they, they fall in your, your lap, you know? Yeah, and sometimes I think it's like, it's, you know, I did a Star Wars book, I did a novel um, for, um, that took place between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi and tied into The Force Awakens. And, um, you know, that was scarier because I was so close to it. I mean, Princess Leia, you know, uh, growing up in the, um, in the, you know, 80s, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's like your girl, her and Marion Ravenwood, that was it, you know? So, <laughs> um, so like, um, you know, th that was like very dear to my heart and I didn't really want to mess it up. But sometimes it's like with that girl, like I loved her, you know, always, um, you know, especially from the Adam West show, you know, uh, Yvonne Craig, but, um, but like I had a little bit more psychic distance. So it was kind you know, I, I like the idea too of like sort of um, revisiting something that you kind of know, but maybe isn't like your blood DNA, because I think all of us very clearly as creators, we have those influential films and books and comics that make up our narrative DNA, you know? And so um, sometimes it's really hard to write those things because they are so stitched into the core of you. And it's almost sometimes I like getting the challenge of something that's, you know, that I'm familiar with, but, you know, but that I don't have all the, you know, that I'm not a fangirl of necessarily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The version of that, the version of that for me is that Dy Dynamite has had the James Bond license almost the whole time I've been working for them, and I I can't pitch a James Bond thing. Like I don't, I don't. It's like it's my favorite thing from my childhood, and I'm like, I don't, I don't want to like, I don't want to pitch a lame James Bond thing. I don't want to make a lame James. And every 
pitch I come up with is so not anything they would ever publish. <laughs> I pitched one thing just because I knew it wouldn't. I was like, this is what I would do. You have a Princess Diana type death and MI6 wants to investigate it and they're told to back off by uh, the, pr the prime minister. And of course, Bond discovers she was killed by a double O agent because she was dating a Muslim prince. <laughs> And he was like, yeah, Eon Productions is not going to do James Bond finds out the British Secret Service killed Princess Diana. That's not going to be that's not going to be our story. But the worst example of pulling on a thread, just as an aside, after the first terrible Hobbit movie came out, I read I reread the book. And there's a lot, you know, Gandalf always fucks off in the second act and comes back in the third act. Uh, and uh, Gandalf comes back and the Hobbits say, where where you where you been, Gandalf? And. He says, oh, I did a thing with the necromancer. Don't worry, I took care of it. And reading the book, I went, that's going to be 90 minutes of screen time in a movie. <laughs> like, Peter Jackson is going to turn, yeah, thing with the necromancer, but don't worry, I, I worked it all out. I was like, that is going to occupy, that's going to cost $200 million, that one sentence in Tolkien. And someone told me in the second or third Har Hobbit movie that that actually comes up. I have a... I have a Godfather pitch that I'm obsessed with, and I don't even know how to begin the process of of clawing that license out of anybody's hands. Uh, but you get these you get these odd things, and you go like, "Oh, there's a missed opportunity in that story." And that is, I think, the most exciting thing is when you find, like in the case of Female Furies, it's like, "What made Granny Goodness Granny Goodness?" How'd she end up like that? How'd she end up with a, a a a small army of female commandos on a in a society like Apocalypse? That's a fascinating question, you know. That's a you know, and that's what you always. And yeah, when you're too close to it, finding the fascinating question that you really want to pull hard on and see where it takes you, can be a little a little trickier. I'm I'm know? so curious, Sean, with um, you know, obviously don't say anything <laughs> because I'm sure you can't, but I'm so curious with future state, what um, threads you pulled on and what, you know, since it's called future state, you know, that like what, what that future state is and what, you know, what sort of Superman is in that, um, in whatever that <laughs> means. Right. Um, I'm really curious about that. And I'm curious about, um, you know, just from the name of it, like, um, you know, how, how was it sort of, um, I'm assuming, sort of breaking away from continuity since it's, I'm assuming, in the future? Um, uh, you know, uh, 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 was that freeing in a way? Was that? Yeah, you know, like with everything you guys are saying, I think the two things were really freeing. One that I wasn't, I wasn't coming to it. I had respect for the Superman character and a recent fascination, but it, I wasn't like a zealot of it. You know, like I think if I got like an X-Men book, I would, I would be so nervous the whole time that I was just going to become a, I would just write facsimiles of Claremont because that's what I grew up reading, yeah. you know? And I'd be like, ah, oh, shit, he did that. So I, I don't know if I can even go down that path and all that. Where with Superman, there was a level of me going like, <clears throat> Red Death of Superman when it came out. Like, I remember that, back, but I'm like, I don't really know that much outside of this. So it was, it was totally freeing. And also I was given Jonathan Kent. So the, the young, the young Superman, not Clark, which, which was more exciting for me in some ways because I was like some of the things that I had trouble with connecting to Clark when I was younger, like the impenetrable alien character. It was like, oh, John's human and his dad is like the largest shadow a, a person can cast over your life imaginable. So like there was some like human dramatic stuff that I was like, oh, I think I understand. I can get into this guy. Um, and the future stuff was great because yeah, Jamie and the and the editor Jamie Rich and and Brittany Hollis or the, the the editorial team on Superman were kind of like they were able to tell me where I was fucking up continuity. <laughs> like I would turn to a draft and they'd be like, that line can't be there. And I'm like, why? And they'd be like, uh, issue such and such, or in the or after future state, this is gonna happen. So we, we can't. Yeah. But outside of that, because it was in the future, there was just a level of like I could throw out insane things and they were like, awesome. That's what we brought you here for. And yeah. which was really, really, really fun to be able to go. But like you were saying too, though, like a lot of it is influenced off of, I read a couple of old, I mean, it's in the solicit. So like it's in a bottled city. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. So I went back and I read a bunch of the original issues that had the first appearance as a Candor. And, um, and there was just things in that that popped up or characters who did that. I'm like, oh, well, this is going to be the villain in it because he was the villain in the first one, but we've got to make him, like, how can I explode it? Which was fun. I mean, I- I'm sure your experience is like this. Like, I don't know if you work with Bixie, but it, if, I don't know if she goes across all the lines, but Bixie Matthew, anytime I need to read something, if I'm like, I want to look at a loose canon comic, like this, like, <laughs> really random character from like the 80s, I'm like, I'd love to see loose cannon's first appearance or. Can you send me every ambush bug appearance in the past like fifteen years? Yeah, I do. I do love that about about them, and you know, and I, uh, you know, um, Brittany and um, Jamie were my editors on Female Furies, and they're just excellent. In they're amazing. you know, they're amazing editors, and um, but uh, yeah, I mean, for me, it's I would just and Brittany was my editor on Batgirl when I first started Batgirl, and um, you know, uh, like uh, that's that was key was just always getting the resources that I need. And like, you know, it's interesting. And I don't know how all of you, um, I really like to do the research and I really like to be able to, and it could also have to do with the fact that, and I don't mean to bring it up again, but that I'm a woman, I get questioned a lot about, you know, um, my cred, my validity, if I really know these characters and stuff like that. So I do my homework because I need to be able to like, sort of, A, it's fun for me, that's the job, but B, also, Like, you know, with like female furies, people would say, you know, people said a lot of terrible things about me online. And, you know, they'd be like, she never even read it, obviously. And it's like, okay, this panel in my book, uh, let me point it to you in uh, in the issue of, uh, you know, the new gods. Let me point this, you know, everything is like, you know, specifically thing. But, but uh, I was shocked because um, I've heard that not, a lot of like sometimes like you know um the people that i would ask for research materials like even if i was doing like a 10 page story you know um for something at dc and i'd be like oh can i read all of uh this you know this part or this or this and they'd be like wow like huh you know not everybody does that they just kind of wing it i'm like what why would you it's so fun it's like your job right. to read these specific comics yeah. and, and get and particularly comics. yeah the research in this case is comic books <laughs> like, you don't want to read the comic books i do a lot of i've done a lot of period stuff and i do a ton of research on it i try to get it uh right and to me and it's period research is a lot like continuity in that it shackles you in an interesting way it creates yeah. things where you go i can't have that because that didn't exist for two more years I can't have Doc Savage, like, I can't have the bad guys use radar because there was no radar in 1939. I got to come up with something that's not radar. That's yeah. interesting. Like, Well, yeah, to- I mean, it, it, yeah, yeah, you get a sandbox, right? It's like in, in, in film, I've written John Hinckley, I've written Evil Knievel, and it was like, these were real people, and they talked a certain way, and they walked a certain way, and they did certain things. And so it's like, so, so again, it, it, it's like you're saying, it is freeing, right? I mean, it's like you're... Uh, and, and to me, it's, it's, a it's, 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 so, so yeah, the idea of writing Hinckley without like reading a Hinckley biography or something right. like that is absurd, right? And I read a whole, I used Amelia Earhart as a character. I read a whole Amelia Earhart biography and literally only used something on one page. But the one page literally is the climax of the book. She wrote a, my a spoiler alert for a five year old comic, she sacrifices herself to save the world, basically. She wrote a poem called Courage that I had never heard of before in this book about how dying because you did something brave is worth it. And I played out the last three pages of the series are just her poem and Dave Acosta's images. And with no humility, it is beautiful. But it's beautiful because it's Amelia Earhart. And I had to read 500 pages of Amelia Earhart to find that one poem, that one 20 line, whatever it is, poem, and totally worth it. <laughs> and now I know a bunch of stuff about you, Amelia Earhart that could come in handy someday. But also the thing of, it, it bugs me when people get the language was wrong, get language wrong, get because to me that's the, the joy is getting to speak another language. Yeah. The joy is learning a world and being conversant in it and saying, this is how they act on Apocalypse. This is how Superman behaves. This is how Batgirl behaves. Other people have set that up. Like I said, like writing about a historic figure, 
not violating that for the purpose of simply, and look, writers do that with their own characters who they created. They violate the character they created to make an easy choice as a writer. It's my least favorite thing. You see it a lot in TV writing. A character will do something completely off model simply because the writer needs this particular conflict in this particular scene. And it drives me, it's like, this is literally just to throw a stone in the way of the story because they couldn't come up with an organic conflict. So they had to violate their own rules. But if you've done your homework, right, then you it's a choice. It's not just an accident or just like uh, whatever. It's like, you know, it, it's like, you know, with Batgirl, right? There were a lot of things, um, you know, that happened that, that I have to tie up at the end because, you know, because Batgirl was finishing and stuff. And, you know, a lot of people sort of like, ask like why it gets so political at the end spoiler alert it gets she's political well if you know the history of batgirl you know uh she be, she was a congresswoman she became the youngest congresswoman in america in the 1970s in her bra in her that's her legacy that's what that's she did. wild i did not know that she that's great alexandra ocasio cortez where you there are just these images and it's like she's the only young woman in congress there's like a, a sea of white men behind her and like barbara gordon is like you know congresswoman by day you know um bat girl by night and it's like it's like that's part of her legacy and so it's like it's like that's a specific choice or an option that you can put on the table for maybe someone else who you know will come down the line but but you know about that. I didn't know that either until I read every single thing about Batgirl. And it's kind of like what you were saying, Sean. Did, um, I, I'm curious, did you find some things that you're not going to be able to use? Because I, I did so with Batgirl, that you're not going to be able to use in, um, in uh, with, um, you know, a, a Superman Future State, but that like, you're like, oh, I could do something with this. Oh, yeah. There, I mean, there was a ton in research that would just be, especially older. The older issues just really got to me because there was so many from the 60s and 70s that I just never even thought about looking through. But yeah, a bunch that I'm like, oh, if I got the chance to come back in this, because like I also, I, I'm in the, I don't know exactly where it's going, <laughs> like after Future State, that I was like, oh, that could be such an amazing storyline down the line if, if you got the opportunity to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like for me, um, with Batgirl, I would love to do a six issue mini series of Batgirl, Barbara Gordon, but in the 1970s, like okay. in the seventies with the equal rights amendment, like total okay. feminist stuff, because in her original bronze age thing, when you're reading it, a lot of the, um, the battles that she has to do are very female centric in a way that I think could be really fun if they were set in that time. Like there's like a guy who's killing women with wigs and like, you know, there's like, com you know, computer dating, but like from the 70s. So it's like punch cards and like, just um, <laughs> she's like fight, you know, marching for equal rights. I, I just, I just think that, that, that could be, you know, that would be really interesting to like, but not as like a continuity in continuity thing, but just like, um, like yeah. a little, you know, little mini series, like, you know, I don't know who knows what will happen over there. And maybe they'll, maybe there'll be more opportunities, um, in the next coming years with that, everything that's changing over there. Um, for like, you know, kind of weird, cool stories that are, you know, outside, you know, I like that. So, I mean, their black label books are so awesome. Yeah. And, you know, and they've done, and they've also done really well that it makes me because, like, when you're talking about this, it's funny. Like, yours is yeah, such a my bucket list. <laughs> like, I, I, wanna, I, I feel I feel envious in some ways because yours is so so focused and at a point where like the the things I got really obsessed with with the old Superman is like there's like a long stretch where like none of the writers can agree on what his powers are, and he gets these like insane powers like. There's a point where like, he can create other mini supermen outside of his own body. And so like, he's like, there's like a whole stretch in the seventies where like Superman will almost like basically climb out of his mouth and like fly off and fight other people. And there was just something interesting to me about like the, the miscommunication or the mis. Yeah. Oh, it'd be interesting. Like what if Superman was even more powerful than we knew, but he's, he's chosen to, to temper it down in a way that we can understand where it's like, I have these like four base powers, but there's all this other, other stuff going on with them. Like it, it's just that type of stuff that keeps popping up in the older books, especially when I think like 
they're not as worried about continuity and it's a lot of just like how do we sell the issue this this month like yeah. how well there's a much there's, of this there's, there's a point i make all the time about all of this stuff that we do i think the first time i said it was at a convention of pulp fans like literally 1930s pulp magazine fans none of this stuff was supposed to survive right. you were supposed to read your issue of the shadow and throw it in the garbage you were supposed to read your issue of batman throw it out you weren't supposed to keep it you weren't supposed to put it in mylar you like it wasn't no one in 1938 writing about you know when they were writing batman in 1938 no one was thinking in 20 years someone is going to have to remain true to all of this stuff that we set up they were improving at all times and there's a charm to that there's a charm to the 1970s superman and that clear mandate of like what crazy ass thing Lois turns into a dragon. Like, you know, what what are, what are we going to do to give us a spectacular cover image this week? Because really, that's all it is. It's the spectacular cover image. And then, and they weren't thinking about collection to trade, right? And like for no, trade, didn't years, exist. You know, so and and it's now. I think it. I think that's why I really like these sort of like six issue, twelve issue sort of mini series things because I think like a novelist. That's my first training, right? So like. That's, I, I like to have, and the first books that I did were graphic novels. So I like to think in terms of like, you know, like a, like a, like a novel. I remember when Shade the Changing Girl, Shade the Changing Woman was happening, which was the, thir the third six issue thing. Um, they weren't quite sure whether or not we would get an additional six or if we were going to stop at number 18, you know. And me and Marley Zarconi, the, um, the artist, we had an idea of where we wanted it to end. And I was like, well, if they can't tell us if it's going to be six or 12, then let's just do it in six. And we'll just tell them that we're going to say goodbye after that, because otherwise we wouldn't have control. And I had a very specific, you know, Marley and I had a very specific idea that we wanted to set down. And I think that in those days you weren't, you, like you said, you yeah. know, you weren't about that and you weren't thinking about like how does this how does this all make sense um and you know how is this a coherent story where because you know when when we were all growing up reading comics right like when you have the spinner rack i mean you you, you i i don't know about you guys but i would go from west coast avengers to you know batman to um x-men to richie rich to i mean it would just be like a pile of comics next to me and then i'm just you know sort of reading them in, in random order, you know? Well, and all the stories are, it's exactly the same evolution with television. All the stories are self-contained and not only self-contained, you often forget like, they're not even 24 pages. There's a 16 page something. And then there's an eight page something after the first one in a lot of comics too. You get like, I, I did this article for a website where they, they, pick a, they pick a week in comics, this week in comics, however many years ago. And I picked, this week in November of 1985. Uh, and it was Miracle Man number three, Swamp Thing number 35 or something. And one of the books I read that week was Sergeant Rock 408 or however many goddamn issues of Sergeant Rock there were at that time. But it was just a fascinating pile of nonsense that was what I read that week. And, it was, and I had forgotten, like the Sergeant Rock comic had three stories in it. The, the Miracle Man story, had a had a backup feature because it was all reprinted from British comics. They had the Warpsmith thing that the the one Alan Moore thing nobody remembers. Um, so it's kind of an interesting how much that that standalone culture has changed and how much sadly it has become gatekeepery for new fans uh, to read a superhero book yeah. now. You know, no matter how much you love Batman in your TV show or movie, you walk into a comic book shop and it's Batman 527 and you're like, am I really going to like jump in on fi at, at number 527? I don't know that I want to do that. Um, and that's still that's still a challenge, I think, for for the for the big two of doing that instead. of Like we're not on episode 700 of William Shatner in Star Trek. We're on series well, you know, we're on, we've got a new everybody uh, is what they keep doing with those premises. Um, I think young people's, you know, the, I mean, I think that's why the young readers at DC, you mm -hmm. know, Marvel is doing one now too, is like, you know, is a way 
to, you know, because those are contained stories and you don't have to know what came before, what came after, and it's in its own world. And I think, I think those little bubble, the, I think that's why Black Label works really well. You know, I think that's why, you know, Shade could work or Female Furies because they're, they're contained, you get it in a book, you're done, and, and, and you don't have to know more about the character than what you learn in those pages. You know? Right. And, um, and when you deal with an iconic character, right, you're dealing with Batman. Well, you know, he lives in a spooky manner. And he's, you know, right. He's were killed. And, well, and, I, and also, if you go back and reread those comics, Marvel and DC, when they did have a serialized story, oh boy, did you get a lot of recap per issue. Like, you got a full page of, you know, whether it would be Spider-Man telling Aunt May, well, I can't believe that Doc Ock just ran off with Mary Jane and this happened and this happened. And you're like, I read that. I, I did read the previous issue. I don't actually need you to do this every single time. My One of my favorite 21st century innovations in comic books is the inside the front cover recap. <laughs> Not having to do it on the page where in a trade paperback, it's going to look absurd. Uh because like the Frank, I've been reading pretty obsessively the entire Frank Miller run of Daredevil, and there is not a first page of, of any issue over like it's got to be like thirty issues, where like it always starts with this is Daredevil years ago there was an explosion that made him lose his senses. It's all he's like taking a shower. And it's just like he can hear better. He can he can jump. He can. I'm like this is amazing. This is totally. You just don't get it because you're like oh this is like if I. If I am back in 1985 and I pick this up the first time, I'm like, oh, okay, I know who this guy is. And he fights a big fat guy. Got it. Perfect. I know exactly what's going on. Yeah. But yeah, they were, there was such an obsession with any comic, no matter how serialized, you should be able to pick it up. I mean, you know, you're an X-Men fan. I love Claremont. But oh my God, you go back and read those and every dial, every thought balloon is a recap of the previous 20 issues. Everyone's like, I can't believe Wolverine is still thinking about, it's like, oh my God. Stop. Yeah, but that, but that Dark Phoenix uh, run, oh. like that, you know, it's like, that was some good. Oh, yeah. I, I read those, I, I read those on the newsstand and there's some of my favorite comics. I think there's an irony uh, that the Dark Phoenix storyline has been told basically three times in pop culture in the last couple of years. And the worst version was the dark Phoenix movie. Like the umbrella Academy first season is an incredibly good adaptation of the dark Phoenix saga, you know, of, of the one member of the team who's more powerful than anybody knows and becomes evil. Like, I feel like we've seen variations on that uh, over and over again. People really like that story and that the Marvel X-Men movie was the worst telling of the Jean Grey saga there is a there is an irony in there when the pastiche is better can i tell a little my like a little uh chris claremont story uh, you know whatever. i mean maybe it's i don't know whatever but it made me happy so you know i started going to comic conventions when i was 11 and um when i was about 13 or 14 years old um and this was right when kitty was like a big you know deal and i was at a convention and um i had a shag haircut and i was 14 years old and like i walked by the table and it was chris claremont was there and, and i think with jack Byrne, and um and uh and they were like oh my god you're a kitty <laughs> like and that was like that was like i was like oh my god and i uh that was a it was a it really was a big deal i was not cosplaying to be clear i was just myself <laughs> walking by. but um but that was really uh that I don't know, you know, it, it it was it was nice to have a character that um, that I knew that you know that sort of um, was you know sort of vital to a fourteen year old girl who was reading comics was a, in nineteen eighty four. You know, the the only time I've been accused of doing cosplay when I wasn't doing cosplay, the mustache is relatively new, like the last five years. I posted a picture on Instagram of me being interviewed on camera for something. And I was in a suit looking how I look. And a friend of mine commented, Commissioner Gordon, do you have a statement about the Batman? <laughs> and I was kind of like, yeah, I can, I can, I can see that. I can see the mustache isn't quite as, uh, as fluffy, but, uh, 
it helps me now at conventions. I can say this is lazy Jim Gordon cosplay. That's it's all. Yeah, when when you and I sat down for the first time, you know, and we had. Uh, I, I mean, I think we. I, I think we both thought we were sitting down for whatever a half hour chat and it ended up being like a three hour, you know, rap session. But um, I remember texting back and forth and, uh, and you know, as you do when you're meeting someone for the first time, it's like, okay, I'm going to be sitting here and you're like, I look vaguely like commissioner Gordon. <laughs> 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 and, 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 and there's this shit running through my head when I, when I hear that. And then, you know, and then I, I, you know, I'm, I'm pulling into the coffee shop and I see this guy sitting uh, outdoors at the cafe and I'm like, yep. He looks vaguely like Commissioner Gordon. <laughs> That's dead on. Speaking it's a good of thing to have in your pocket. Speaking of Chris Claremont, I had you want a big 1980s comics fan moment. I was having lunch with Kevin Eastman at New Mexico Comic Con, and Chris Claremont walked by and wanted a picture with him. <laughs> so I took a picture of Chris Claremont and Teenage Mutant and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Hey, that's the great thing about comics is that it's like, you know, or pop culture writing, right? Like movies, television, opera, plays. I'm, I'm going to put plays and operas in there. Is that, you know, is that you're, you're constantly referencing something that you, that, you, um, that you think is really cool and that you nerd out over. Well, and it's funny because you mentioned, uh, you've mentioned Dare, Daredevil. This is like a scene from a bad biopic, but it is absolutely true. Kevin was the one obsessed with... Frank Miller and Laird was the one obsessed with Chris Claremont. They both liked Jack Kirby and Chris. They both had this, but literally Kevin draws the turtle and wrote, writes Ninja turtle. You know, you're, you're that's, that's your Frank Miller. Yeah. And Laird writes teenage mutant over it. <laughs> bringing, bringing the, I was like, it's so cut and dried. If you put it in a biopic, people go, it wasn't that. Uh, it wasn't that like split, right? It wasn't that obvious, but no, it actually was that obvious. <laughs> like you went, no, let's add the Claremont thing, Ninja Teenage Mutants. Anyway, we should, we've kept you guys a while. We should wrap up. Uh, we usually do so by saying, where can we find your stuff? What are you working on next? Sean. Sure. Um, I'm only on Twitter, I guess, at this point. So I'm at Sean Chris Lewis. Um, Bliss is still coming out from Image Comics with me and Caitlin Yarsky. If nothing else, Caitlin's art in it is unbelievable, so people should check it out for her. Um, and then, yeah, DC Future States, uh, Superman comes out starting in January. Nice. Cecil? Pre-order pre now, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Always pre-order. <laughs> Always pre-order. <laughs> Sorry, Cecil, I, I interrupted you. No worries. Um, I'm. I can't wait to. I can't wait to read it, Sean. I'm really excited. Um, uh, uh, I'm at Miss Cecil on Twitter and at Cecil Seaskull, which was my old punk name, uh, on, on Instagram. And um, uh, what do I have coming out? Batgirl just finished, um, so you should pick that up because the trade is going to come out. Um, and uh, I'm really, really proud of having done issue 47 as a response to the killing joke. And uh, I really feel like it was a highlight of, of my career, reframing it as a sort of feminist, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 reframe of that story dealing with, you know, Great. turning the tables on trauma. So um, that's that. And then I have this one shot in Black Hammer that's coming out um, sometime next year. And um, and then the short story, uh, that family short story in um, in DC uh, in DC Metal, which uh, I wrote a St. Crispin State speech in, and mm. I'm hoping that um, uh -huh. I'm hoping that um, some some actors or something will like want to say the speech because I really I studied like like I really looked hard at all the Shakespeare you know and 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 tried to make it like that so that's my that's my big dream and then um I just sold uh two comics two uh two creator owned things um that are not announced yet but I just sold them two weeks ago so uh so I'm starting to work on those so expect those in um uh, I think one will be out next, uh, next like December. And then the other one, um, is a graphic novel. So it'll be out in like two years. So, um, so yeah, so stay tuned. Yeah. Congratulations. Nice. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to turn on my red light because, uh, he loves, yes. uh, Ryland loves the red light when it gets dark <laughs> it. while we're in the middle yeah. of, uh, doing a thing. Uh, I have nothing coming out 
through normal channels at the moment. I just did a Kickstarter for an Elvira book called The Omega Mam, which is a post-apocalyptic satire of the COVID era uh, in which Elvira discovers uh, she goes into a coma uh, from overdosing on hairspray because she can't get to the beauty parlor and wakes up to discover that the earth is overrun by zombies who became zombies because they ingested cleaning products uh, to, to ward off COVID and the combination of the two things. It's a political satire and that'll probably be solicited, I imagine at some point uh, from Dynamite and also just wrapped up a, a piece for a uh, anthology called Nightmare Theater. Again, these will probably be after they get to the after they get to the the Kickstarter supporters, I'm sure they'll be available. For that, I did a story called German Chocolate, which is based on the fact that my dad wrote hard-boiled pulp fiction and was a World War II veteran. This is a true story. He told me the grim fairy tales as World War II combat stories about himself. <laughs> so like when the hunters come in to rescue Little Red Riding Hood, it's my dad's reconnaissance squad in the Black Forest in 1944, and the wolf is a Nazi. So I did a version of Hansel and Gretel. Uh, that sounds that's really cool. Yeah. Thank you. It's I, it's something that I'm going to try and do a series or a graphic novel of, because there's, there's an endless <clears throat> number of stories. Yeah. Uh, but the, uh, and again, the artist Sylvia Califano, who does Star Trek over at IDW, I can't tell you the emotion of seeing someone do comics of your dad when he was 20 years old and it actually looks like him. Like from, I guess, sent her a bunch of his war photos and she reproduced him beautifully and it's really moving stuff. And on, on top of that, the only thing that I have, I don't even think my name's gonna get on it. I helped Kevin with a Conan piece. Uh, I did some writing on a, a, a 10 page Conan thing that's in the big Conan special uh, coming out. Um, and a bunch of movie and TV stuff that I can't really talk. I've been working a little bit on the Red Sonja movie uh, the last two years. So, Ryland? Uh, I am at Ryland Grant on all uh, forms of social media. That's R-Y-L-E-N-D-G-R-A-N-T. If you are listening, uh, I always spell it because it's not a real name. My parents drunkenly kind of arranged letters and saddled me with it. And so uh, it always gets misspelled and misconstrued. Uh, my books, uh, the Ringo Award-winning Aberrant and uh, the Ringo-nominated Banjax, my kind of uh, fuck you to uh, Batman and my fuck you to Captain America, <laughs> sort of. Maybe the only time I'll ever do superheroes. Uh, they are available in fine comic shops everywhere and on Comixology and Amazon and all that. Um, the, uh, the Jump. Um, my uh, sort of thriller that takes place in the world of astral projection is available currently on Backer Kit, and our uh, our mutual IP agent uh, Eric Reed is in the process of working mad magic with this thing. So, uh, look forward uh, in another forum uh, sometime soon. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, yeah, like like you, Avalonia, I, uh, my works are gummed up. I have about five things in the pipe, but they are, uh, you know, uh, on pause and, uh, and, 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 and being rerouted and all of that stuff. Um, I somehow managed, uh, to get a movie shooting in the middle of all this fucking nonsense. That's right. Uh, uh, state of consciousness, this kind of, um, uh, big sci-fi psychological mind fuck starring Emile Hirsch is, uh, uh, just wrapped uh, the Italy leg of their shooting, uh, getting out of there at the last possible second, I guess, before they basically closed down the entire country. Now they are on to Guatemala. Uh, hopefully they, uh, you know, they, they, fair, they have better luck down there in terms of uh, this illness that's beating everybody up. But um, uh, we're crossing our fingers, hoping it gets across the finish line. But uh, that's what's up in Riley's world right now. Uh, other than that, um yeah thanks guys for listening thanks for joining yeah, thank, us and uh, thank you so much for so for being on the show i knew it would be delightful and it was yeah, thanks for having me. and it was uh yeah take it easy guys and happy thanksgiving everyone happy thanksgiving if you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to smash that like button. If you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or other fine purveyors of ear crack, please leave us a five-star review. And wherever you're watching and or listening, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. We'll see you back here next week for more Madcap Hijinks on The Writer's Blog.